for Grand Rounds for the year. Um, and I'd like to um, welcome Professor Lashini Nadu from Western Sydney University, who's going to talk about forced migration and critical human rights, crossing boundaries, bridges, and building, building bridges. bridges. And she has one of her students with her as well. Biruk. Biruk. So he's going to be sharing the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Can I start? Out of the other way around, that's fine. <laughs> On the 16th of June 1976, when I was sitting my senior mid year examinations, my life was shaken irrevocably. On this day, high school youth in Soweto, South Africa, took to the streets to protest the government's decision that they be educated in a strange tongue. But it was also a day I remember because hundreds of school children around my age died that day. Two years later, when I walked out of my university lecture room with my classmates, we were ambushed by the South African riot police, shot at with rubber bullets, hit with batons and tear gas. Two years later, my brother, a medical student, was detained for protesting against a tripartite system of government. He was tortured and died not long thereafter. Our only crime was that we sought an education in the land of our birth. Our struggle was a fight about the harsh reality of our lives, state-sponsored violence and systematic human rights abuses. The challenges I had experience in the early years remain among the most important and have had an impact on my collective psyche as my life growing up in South Africa was torn asunder by the depressive machinery of segregation that stigmatized and polarized and in turn impacted on the construction of an identity that was unstable in the black and white map of South African race relations. Given my erasure from the public imagination and the alienation bred by racial difference, unbelonging and dispossession, I chose to migrate to Australia. As with my family, as the falsity of the South African nation's sense of self had been exposed. My life in South Africa, however, provided fertile ground for teaching me about the value of humanity, about community, about respect and justice. It taught me about the destructive powers of difference and prejudice and has been a constant reminder to me that the human is essential determinant of rights. Good morning to you all, or good afternoon to you all. It is my privilege to be with you here today amongst students, uh, health professionals, educators, community members, to lead the platform for dialogue, for exchanging ideas about migration, social justice, and diversity that affect us all. I would like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which Western Sydney University stands, the Darug people, and to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I would also like to thank uh, the Westmead Children's Hospital, in particular the Education Centre, for their hospitality and for being kind enough to extend an invitation for me to speak to you today. Our gathering is timely and at a critical juncture for Australia and the world. I thought it might be useful to consider forced migration under the following headings. Understanding forced migration, types of forced migration, forced migration experience, human rights, human right declarations, and the right to health care.
This year, my colleagues and I launched our book on forced migration, focusing on refugee education in particular. We wrote this book as the largest wave of forced migrants since World War II left hostilities behind in their home countries as part of a de desperate search for haven, security and succor in new lands. more than a political status. It is the most pervasive kind of cruelty that can be exercised against a human being. You are forcibly robbing this human being of all aspects that would make human life not just tolerable but meaningful in many ways. The more immune you are to people suffering, that's very, very dangerous. It's critical for us to maintain this humanity. without any sense of them being able to make something out of their lives, then they will become very vulnerable to all sorts of exploitation, including radicalization. <laughs> people from different religions, different cultures, are going to have to learn to live with each other. The response to forced migration from countries around the world has been mixed. Germany initially reacted with generosity. Some Eastern European nations closed their borders, and at the time that we were writing our book, were refusing to open them despite agreements reached within the EU. Trump was elected president, the US quota of refugees was halved, and bans were placed on people arriving from designated nations that were deemed to be terrorist threats. The British made the shock decision to Brexit, and the campaign leading up to the referendum was marred by narratives of racism and finger-pointing as at the supposed damage caused by British employment by immigration. Australia increased its humanitarian intake, but continues to deal harshly with those who arrive via boats. And yet, Humanity resides and remains in the most unexpected of corners and times. The photo of a three-year-old toddler washed up on a beach and cradled by a Turkish soldier was flashed around the world, causing a brief pause in hostilities before the debate about forced migration was taken up with renewed vigor and venom. What is our role as human beings in such debates? What is the role of civic institutions? How can they and we react with courage, care, sensitivity, heightened responsiveness in ways that support, sustain and nurture this new demographic? Each of the authors in writing the book 
shared a family history of immigration to Australia. Due to economic strictures, conflict in our homelands, and or sometimes a desperate desire for a better life. Each of us is as educators with a passion for social justice and many years of experience teaching and researching with young learners from forced migrant backgrounds in schools and universities. As university educators, we perceived a disturbing lack of social justice in terms of recognition, redistribution and representation for young people from forced migrant backgrounds who were often rendered invisible. Debates in Australia have focused on the genuineness of those applying for resettlement, highlighting the supposed negative impact of forced migrants' arrivals in Australian society and stressing the need to look after our own. Similar debates are occurring around the world uh, on the issue of immigration. Australia is now the fastest growing country in the OECD, that's the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, with immigration skyrocketing by 27% last year, and the percentage of Australians born overseas now equivalent to 28%. The responses towards migrants are of significance because they help illuminate the dynamics of social inclusion. Forced migration is a general term that refers to the movements of refugees and internally displaced persons, those displaced by conflicts uh, within their country of origin, as well as people displaced by natural disasters or environmental disasters, chemical or nuclear disasters, famine or developmental projects. In a world of some 7 billion people, an unprecedented 25.6 million have been forced from their home. 22.5 million are refugees, 10 million are stateless, and close to 200,000 resettled refugees. Almost 29,000 people are forced to flee daily. These figures are staggering and play a central role in global processes of social economic and political change. Now, there are three main types of the migrants that I spoke of. There's the refugees, migrants who, who migrate in for work in terms of economic reasons, and then you have the uh, internally displaced persons, and that's due to environmental development, uh, climate control, and so forth. The main three main causes of displacement, conflict occurs when people are forced to flee their homes as a result of violent conflict, including civil war, violence, and persecution on the grounds of nationality, race, religion, political opinion, or social group. Um, for example, what I have here is the genocide in Rwanda, or we can look at the current violence between Jews and Muslims in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Development-induced uh, displacement is when people are compelled to move as a result of policies and projects implemented to advance development efforts. And the example I've used here is a large-scale infrastructure projects such as you know, dams, roads, and ports. For example, if we look here, uh, Texaco, the oil company, uh, le led to the contamination of large areas of the Amazon, which meant in Ecuador, which led to the massive displacement of the Kofan people in Ecuador, uh, who are native, they're native to Ecuador, and this is the region right next door to Colombia. So that Latin America now is placed with a huge problem of forced migrants. Uh, the third one is the disaster-induced uh, um, displacement, and here I've looked at the earthquake in Haiti in 2010 uh, as a natural disaster where a number of people were displaced, and Haiti is uh, currently uh, regard, ranked as the most vulnerable nation in the world 
Um, I've just recently returned from Chile where um, I had to talk about forced migration because Chile has, is dealing with a large number of Haitians who've uh, been displaced from the earthquake. Now, apart from these uh, three categories, there are, there are a few other types of migrants. Um, you have refugees, as I explained, are people um, who, um, who are residing outside their country of nationality due to a well-founded fear of persecution or fear because of race, religion, nationality, and so forth. Then you have asylum seekers, who are people who have moved across international borders uh, in search of the protection of the 1951 Refugee Convention. But their refugee status is yet to be determined. And then you have internally displaced persons, IDPs we call them, uh, and those are the three I discussed, conflict-induced, development-induced, uh, climate or um, dis natural disaster. The other categories we have here, are um, smuggled persons or trafficked, and that's usually due, due to coercion or force. And they become forced migrants because uh, of the element of coercion. Okay, what, what are the, some of the lasting solutions for forced migrants? They could either be offered permanent settlement or temporary refuge in the country of asylum, uh, they get permanently settled in a third country, as we are now witnessing in Australia, or there's voluntary return. That's a forced return. And their experience is characterized by culture shock, depression, anger, hope, disappointment, confusion, fear of the unknown, survivor's guilt, helplessness, powerlessness, and self-doubt. So on arrival in the country, these, there could be any number of uh, mental trauma that, that the forced migrants will be going through, uh, and that makes it very difficult as the children from forced migrant backgrounds enter classrooms, where they've come from specific global locations with s specific positionings in, in history that either honor or suppress their voices. Their identity, often labelled negatively by the dominant Western discourse, is therefore developed from their lived experience. The negative and destructive labelling has the potential to further marginalise these students in the classroom. Uh, I'm just going to have Birok, a student of mine, just talk a little bit about his background, his of refugee background, and his family arrived in Australia as refugees. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brook Bogala. Um, I'm 22 years old, and um, I'm from. My mother is Eritrean, as you can see, the northern part, and my father is Ethiopian. I was born in Ethiopia, so. Um, Ethiopia and Eritrea have a love-hate relationship. So, um, in in nineteen ninety-seven, in there was a war. So Eritrea wanted their independence, and me being born in Ethiopia with my along with, along with my younger sister, the Eritrean government and Ethiopian government were at war with each other. So um, we were living in Ethiopia, but then. My mother, being Eritrean, had, um, she was told to leave the country, but we, she couldn't leave the country because our family was settled in Ethiopia, and she herself was born in Eritrea but was raised in Ethiopia. So um, after this happened, we decided to flee to Kenya for two years. We were refugees in Kenya, and the one on the far right is my younger sister, Hannah, and she's celebrating her third birthday in a refugee camp in Dadaab. So um, my mother and my younger sister were sent to a refugee camp while me and my father were staying in Nairobi because we had to look after the process and everything. And also, that's my mother and my younger sister Hannah as well in the refugee camps. This was, um, the, you had around 200,000 plus people in these refugee camps. No running water, no electricity, and even toilet. Those, you had to go to the bush to do your business and things like that. And um, so we were, they were sent into, into the refugee camps while we were in, um, in Nairobi. So 
that, that picture over there represents, no matter the struggle in the refugee camps, they still celebrated their birthdays. They still did whatever they had to do, no matter what the struggle was. And, um, and also, community was number one thing. Um, over there is my mother on the, um, on the left-hand side and with her friends. So they were religious people, you know, they had to go to church and pray to get out of that situation. Um, you know, everything that they did was just involved in, in their local community. Some of these people they've never met in their lives. They've just met them in the refugee camps. And over here is my younger sister and her, her friend. So they always traveled in groups, in um, small groups, because there were people called shifters. So these people were bandits or rebels, whatever you want to define them as. They would come and steal young children or even rape young girls and things like that. And, you know, it wasn't a safe place for, uh, for children or for even women. So even if you went to the p local police, to the Kenyan police, they would say that, you know, there, um, there, there's no shifters, there's no rebels or bandits, you know. Um, so it just goes to show that they didn't really care about your safety in the refugee camp. You were just there. Um, if you didn't like it, so what? You know, you just had to do your time there. Some people spent two years, some people spent even 20 years in a refugee camp. You know, um, and also, as I was saying, this is the basic thing that you had. So you had basic water, rations was the main thing. Uh, you, you lived on that, or if you were lucky enough, you had family overseas that was sending you a little, uh, some money just to buy simple food. And over there is my young sister again with a family friend of hers living in little huts. If you didn't have a tent given to you, you had to make you had to make it yourself. And um, these, these ladies, these people in the refugee camps, they were so, although their circumstances were very bad, they were creative, they had to improvise and things like that. And majority of these people don't know each other, don't know each other. They just met in the refugee camps. Um, and, you know, they had, to make, they had to make friends with each other in order to protect each other and support each other through these hard times. And also, um, this is the Dadaab refugee camp. As you can see, it's close to the um, Somali border. So you'd have, um, you know, the rebels and the bandits cross from the Somali border into the refugee camps and cause chaos and things like that. And this is just an example of a refugee camp, um, a recent one in, in Dadaab. So it's overcrowded, overpopulated. There's not enough resources. And there's also tension between the different groups. You have your Somalis, you have your Ethiopians, your Eritreans, your South Sudanese, you have people from the Congo. And all these people mixed into this, uh, into this like dry land is, is just a recipe for chaos. And any time fights could break out, um, fires or um, any, any sort of thing can break out, even diseases as well. And so the, and as you can see, it's way, it's far, very far away from the capital city, from Nairobi. So if you needed any medical assistance or anything like that, you know, you just had to pray to God or you had to go to the city and hopefully they would, you know, provide for you. And also you couldn't even go to school. You had to go, you couldn't go to the public schools, but you, if you had the, uh, the, ca the capacity, you, had, you enrolled into a private school, but then if you don't have family abroad that could help you, you're on your own. And um, just with my story, so we, um, we, we were refugees in Kenya for two years and the Australian government granted us um, resettlement into, um, to come to Australia in 2003. So I've been here since 2003. And um, once you see your st the struggle in Kenya or in any refugee camp or even being a refugee, you just appreciate life a little bit more than any, th the simplest things count, you know, you are not, no one chooses to be a refugee. You are forced to be a refugee. Um, no one says, oh, I want to be a refugee. No, it's something that happens out of your control. And, um, yeah, and thank you very much for your time. Um, as we've just seen from Beruk's experience, that students from forced migrate, migrant backgrounds who arrive in schools have complex learning needs and often meet resistance due to the, per to the perception that their presence can have a negative effect on the overall academic results of the school because there's that much 
uh, emphasis on performativity. This poses a dilemma for school management on how to implement socially just programs which embrace diversity yet still achieve academic results and improve standing within the community. It is evident that the interaction of people from diverse backgrounds is occurring more significantly due to in part to immigration, displacement and forced location. Okay, so we now move on to human rights education and the acknowledgement of access to education as well as language and culture of, as internationally recognized rights. Article 26 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups and shall further the activities of the United Nations for the maintenance of peace. This was extended in 1989 to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which included cultural rights as well as the values of both the current and heritage nations to which a child identifies. So within the Declaration of Human Rights, there are at least 30 rights for each individual human on this planet. And the remaining articles include the right to asylum, the right to freedom from torture, the right to free speech, and the right to education. I think what we have to understand is that the Human Rights Declaration is merely a declaration. It is not law, which means it cannot be enforced. Um, but we have to ensure that the human rights education is not ahistorical, apolitical and uncritical. Understanding human rights also includes an understanding of diversity, transformative action and social justice. The question that arises for us as educators is whether human rights education adds any new pedagogical approach in the realm of education. And I think this sums it up really nicely. It's a poem by Robert Prouty called My Right to Learn. It says, I do not have to earn the right to learn, it's mine. And if because of faulty laws and errors of design, and far too many places where still far too many people do not care, if because of all these things and more, for me, the classroom door, with someone who can teach is still beyond my reach, still out of sight. Those wrongs do not remove my right. So here I am, I too am one of you, and by God's grace and yours, I'll find my place. We haven't met. You do not know me yet, and so you don't yet know that there is much that I can give you in return. The future is my name, and all I claim is this, my right to learn. Uh, in terms of rights, we, besides the education rights, we have civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights and cultural rights. Um, civil rights deals with standards of judiciary and penal systems. Political deals with components of participation and political power. Economic rights deals with working, producing and servicing. Social rights deal with standard of living and quality of life for all persons. And cultural rights deal with the cultural sphere of life including ethnic culture, subcultures, arts and sciences. These are just a reference to the Human Rights Bill. Um, and the obligations of government, first to respect, to protect, and then to fulfill. Respect in terms of refraining from interfering with the enjoyment of the right. Protect, 
prevent others from interfering with the enjoyment of the right and fulfill, adopt appropriate measures towards realization of the full right. So in order to realize the various rights that I've spoken of, the following is depend, it depends on the state in terms of the following. Resources and capacity, as you no doubt will understand as health uh, professionals and health educators, culture, customs and norms, the strength of civil society, external impacts and pressures, and other non-state actors. So this is basically represented diagrammatically. Uh, or everything that impacts on people and their rights. International actors, civil society, the media, the media has a huge role to play, the private sector and the state. So what are we projecting in terms of education? What do we need? What we need is what we call particip participation competence. Firstly, it's the induction into new and unfamiliar education systems. Remember, people are coming from very, very different histories and locations. Additional language support. Two, challenging racism and hostility. Counseling and psychosocial support. And three, partnerships with organizations. It, it's really about everyone working together academics at the university working with health professionals, with psych psychologists and so forth to provide uh, an enriching environment for those from forced migration backgrounds. The right to health, the underlying determinants, if you look, and I just, this is not my area particularly, but I thought given that I was speaking to, uh, at, the, at the children's hospital, um, that I should bring in the right to health. Okay, so we have health care, the right to health care, uh, underlying determinants, water, sanitation, food, nutrition, housing, healthy occupational and environmental conditions, education and so forth. And so we've got the three A's and a Q, availability, accessibility, acceptability and quality in terms of health care. Critical human rights, what is critical human rights? Critical human rights is based on communities, student communities and local environment which give meaning through their own language and practice. So it's very good to have that partnership with communities. It is diverse and circulates in a society of difference like our own rather than as a homogenous state. I think we have to understand that all people are not the same in terms of culture, in terms of social, economic, they're quite different and we need to see them as different groups. Pedagogic practice includes learning in different contexts, cultures and experiences and this basically means that we do not impose a way of learning, that we actually draw from the prior knowledge and experience the students and persons bring with them. How do we use the knowledge that they have in order to move them forward? And so we say that critical human rights is rooted in students' everyday experiences, aspirations, concerns and needs, rather than abstract and intangible concepts. Right, the example of human rights violation refugees and asylum seekers on Manus Island and Nauru. Um, I, you are all very familiar with this particular environment. And the reduced health care in detention centres. Okay, Australia must reinstate psychosocial support through torture and trauma counselling services for refugees and asylum seekers in PNG. Reinstate translation services for forced migrants like refugees and asylum seekers to ensure healthcare information is provided in a language they understand. To ensure accessibility, availability and quality of healthcare for refugees. And to ensure equal access of refugees to healthcare and health related services comparable to what is provided to other refugees living in Australia. And this is when you send refugees to a third country. 
continue to facilitate the transfer of refugees to Australia when medical treatment or diagnosis cannot be undertaken uh, in PNG, for example, and ensure that the procedures on transfers are clear, effective and determined by medical professionals based on medical needs. Human beings have a basic need to integrate their present with their past. This is why we fixate on the stories of our childhood as the key to who we are today. It took enormous courage for me to remain human against the attempt at erasure in South Africa, and my courage of resistance became a foundation of my character. Critical human rights education will be challenging for health educators, teachers and students to navigate. But those challenges hold as much opportunity for collaboration and transformation within and across cultures as it does for struggle. With that, I wish us all, as we move forward, productive and constructive discussions as we strive to become more diverse, more equal and more socially just. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Oh, yeah. I'll stand over here. Um, I'm sure you'd all like to join me in thanking Lashini and for both sharing their stories. I think that was really powerful and, and really struck me. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I've got the microphone working. Thank you. Uh, it was a great talk. Thank you for that. Uh, the, what's the role of the Human Rights Commission in in all of this, especially for today? I, I'm still trying to understand it in, in, a, in a deeper, deeper I, way. Yeah, I think I think the important thing to be said, as I said before, they are merely declarations; they're not law, which really means all the Human Rights uh, Commission could do is to ensure that they. If Australia, for example, is a signatory to the Human Rights Declaration, that they try as far as possible uh, to honour their obligations. And that is, that's really as far as the human rights. They cannot enforce it by law. I mean, and that's, I think people get rather confused when they say Human Rights Declaration, they've signed it, therefore uh, there's an obligation. It, because it's not law, you can't you know, do much about it. 